head down kingdom, the new creation that he launched through his death and resurrection. This is exciting stuff, and the disciples are ready to go tell the world. But then Jesus tells them to wait, and to stay in Jerusalem until they receive a new kind of power so they can be faithful witnesses to Jesus and his kingdom. Then he says that their mission is going to begin in Jerusalem, then move out to Judea and Samaria, and then from there out into the nations. It's like a road map for the whole book of Acts. Then the disciples saw Jesus enthroned as king of all creation. So the disciples wait, wondering when this power is going to come. And then comes the time of Pentecost. So this is an ancient Israelite festival it's during the early summer, and thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims would come back to Jerusalem from all over the world, all these different languages and cultures colliding in the city. And the disciples are together in a house, which is suddenly filled with rushing wind along with fire. The fire splinters off into tongues of fire hovering over people's heads. What's this all about? Yeah, so Luke is tapping into a repeated Old Testament theme. When God's presence showed up similarly at Mount Sinai, he made a covenant with Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments. Then later, when God's glory came in a pillar of fire, it filled the tabernacle when he came to live among them. That was just one pillar of fire, not many. Exactly. Luke's making an important point here. This is God's personal temple presence, God's spirit that was foretold by Israel's prophets. And now it's come to take up residence in the new temple of Jesus' body, that is, his people. They've become little mobile temples where God now dwells. And they start to tell stories about Jesus, but they're speaking in languages that they didn't know before, yet all the visitors can understand them. What's this all about? Well, Peter gets up to explain that this is the fulfillment of Israel's hopes based on the scriptures. God's plan was always to use the unified family of Abraham to bring peace and justice to the world. But the tribes of Israel had been scattered because of the exile. Now here at Pentecost, representatives from all of the tribes come back together and they're introduced to their Messiah, the crucified and risen Jesus, so they can now become the restored people of Israel. And thousands of them start following the way of Jesus. All right, so that gives us a really good summary of what is happening uh, leading into our uh, text for today. I'm going to do this and see if that's helpful so y'all can see. Yeah, um, that was talking about how what Luke was saying and how it led into what we talked about last week um, and then pulls it into where we're going for today. Just a little bit about Pentecost means 50, so it occurs seven weeks and one day after the Passover for us in this time that's after Resurrection Sunday, so um, it'll be toward the end of May when we uh, celebrate Pentecost, um, and it's considered to be the birth of the church, that experience that they had that we'll talk about, and it's also seen as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And from last week, uh, Brother uh, Fox had a wonderful lesson, and I asked him about using that little snapshot there, because it said Jesus makes a promise, and it, that promise is that they are going to have, Jesus is going to come, he's going to be born, he's going to die, he's going to teach, he's going to resurrect, and he's going to sin. And then he's going to have that promise of the Holy Spirit be fulfilled, and that promise of the Holy Spirit gives us power. So that's all a part of this connection that's happening today. Uh, and then Acts 1, 4 through 5 is uh, important to connect as well. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist, for John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's important. Remember that, okay? And so our scripture starts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language 
being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Okay, so and this is brought to you by the Bible Experience. So important points to kind of pull out in this, and you'll see this word several times in our text, is the word all. They were all together in one place and all of them were filled. And this is important because he came and he bled and he died for everybody. And he is allowing those who receive him that all will have that Holy Spirit uh, to rest upon them. So it's, he's not a respecter of person. It's not going to be just men or just women or just adults or just children. It's all and that's important for us to understand he came bled died rose again and sent the promise for all of us um and it's important that they were all in one place together and that's unification and we want to be unified as the body of christ because great things can happen when we are on one accord and it says they were filled and as uh, believers, when we accept Christ, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But then there's also some continuous feeling um, that takes place. And he tells us in Ephesians 5.18 uh, that we should be filled, implying a process of continuous feeling. And Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. In order to keep step with the spirit, we need to continuously be fed by the spirit. So this is not just a one-time thing and then it, it goes on. It's a, a first indwelling and then we keep uh, going and searching after Christ and getting that continuous filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the other piece I wanted to bring out with that is a quick little snippet, can't go into it a lot, about the other um, speaking in tongues. This is making reference to the fact that they were speaking in other languages that they didn't know, but it was addressing the people who were there in front of them. So they hadn't been um, on Google trying to find out how to speak a new language. They were just there. The gift from God came upon them to speak other people's languages so that they could hear what they were saying in their native tongue. And that was amazing. Uh, it's amazing to me. It's, I'm sure it was amazing to them. Okay, so our two words, obey and speak out. How did they obey Christ? So what was it that the um, 11 did that were made them in obedience to Christ? And that's when I remember, I said, Acts 1 that I read for you is very important. What did they do to obey Christ? Anybody in here, or you can type it on the chat, can't give you quite as long because we are short on time, but how did they obey Christ? stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed in Jerusalem. Absolutely. Thank you, Sister Braxton. And one more thing. They stayed in Jerusalem and they waited for the manifestation of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you but waiting is hard sometimes <laughs> brother fox was in here this morning going it's okay minister graham just wait just wait it's gonna come up <laughs> so waiting can be hard sometimes but we uh need to wait on the lord wait for his guidance wait for his um his understanding to reach us so that we know what we're doing and we can stay in step with the holy spirit amen and then what happened because they obeyed Christ? What was the result of them being obedient and staying put and waiting for the Holy Spirit? God came through with his promise. God came through with his promise. Absolutely. And that manifested itself in a lot of different ways. There was a supernatural move of God 
the Holy Spirit came and people were drawn to the disciples. You had people that were starting to come out because they were looking and they were amazed and they were bewildered and like, what is going on? And them being drawn to the disciples, we will see later, opens the door for them uh, when they start speaking about Christ to be able to receive Christ. Um, and some people, this is part of what happened to, didn't understand. And I wanted to make sure to point out that everybody's not going to understand what is happening when you're obeying Christ. They're going to be like, why are you doing that? That doesn't make sense. I don't understand. That happens sometimes when we obey Christ. Doesn't mean don't do what it is he told you to do. It just means they may not understand and it may not be the time for them to understand yet, but you be obedient to Christ. And then supernatural provision of gifts um, were given at that time. They had the power to do what they couldn't do in their own strength and their own knowledge. So see what can happen when we obey Christ. Um, it would, I mean, it just behooves us when we look at this list to make sure we're always about the business of obeying Christ, amen? And then this is just a little extra note. In order to be continuously filled with the power of God, he needs to know we're gonna be obedient. Because if we are continuously being filled with power, that's that word, the Holy Spirit is our power, and we're not obedient, we can become like a down power line that's live. And that's dangerous. We're flying all and sparking all over the place. So he needs to know that we're going to be obedient uh, so that that power can be directed and funneled in the way it's supposed to be. All right. That's our next section. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Hello, Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him amen that's some powerful scripture right there. He pulled in Old Testament and speaking to them in real time then. And so back to our words here, who obeyed Christ by speaking out for Christ? Who was that? Peter did that. Yeah, it was Peter, absolutely. That was Peter talking and he obeyed by speaking out the gospel message. He was telling them what? that God sent Jesus and he came and y'all put him to death. <laughs> and he did that as by design in order for them to be able to have the forgiveness of sin and to receive eternal life. So that was obedience to the gospel message, uh, sharing the gospel message, which they were told to do in Matthew 28. So you see, there's always some connection 
with God's word. It's never in a silo. And in Matthew 28, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he was doing what he was commissioned to do when he stood up and he spoke out the gospel. That was his obedience. And then what did he say? What is some of what he said in there? What did he say in those that section of scripture? Yes, he said they're not drunk. <laughs> it's nine o'clock in the morning. They're they're not drunk. Remember, sometimes when you're obedient, people might not understand. So let me correct you. They're not drunk. What else? Absolutely. He started talking about what was mentioned in the book of Joel. So uh, he quoted scripture. Uh, and that meant he had to know the scripture in order to quote it, right? So we should study the word so it can be brought to our remembrance when we need it, because there is power in the spoken word of God. There was power in him pulling up what some of them recognized as the word um, from the Old Testament. Um, he dismissed the people's conjecture that they were drunk. Uh, he proclaimed the gospel message. God sent Jesus who did wonders. He was handed over to you by design. You nailed him to the cross. He died, but God raised him from the dead. The grave could not hold him. And then he quoted scripture again, and it's not in our printed text, but it's in the text um, of chapter two. And he spoke some words of David. So he kept pulling them back into the word that they knew because some of them were very versed in those scriptures. That's a drawing um, to people to that word of God, connecting them with the parts that they know. Right? Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amen. Now this, what I have before you, is a little bit more than what your printed text says. So the bold part is what our printed text was, but I felt it was important for you to get those surrounding verses there because it made everything connect together. Um, Peter continued to obey and speak out for Christ. What else did he say in that little section? Repent. Re be repent. Be baptized. What's going to happen if you do that? Gift of life, the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of your sins. Um, and the promise to you and your children. Absolutely. And anybody out there, y'all can chime in if you want to. I know I'm kind of moving fast so we can get to make sure we got to all of our scriptures. Um, he also said God made Jesus Lord and Messiah. So at that point, they, they needed to hear that this man that they were saying, the man from Nazareth, he was Lord. He's the Messiah, the one you said you've been waiting for. He's here. <laughs> He's it. I need you to understand God made him Lord and Messiah. And what else happened? 
the people were cut to the heart when they heard it. Mm -hmm. And they asked, what shall I do? Mm -hmm. The word of God will prick the heart. We just need to know the word, share the word. The word will do the work. It will change minds and hearts and consciences to be able to draw toward Christ. Know the word so you can speak that word and obey him and speak it when he tells you to speak it because he knows whose heart's ready to be pricked and cut at the right time. Uh, then Peter said some more, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the Holy Spirit. All, and with that word again, the, this promise is for everyone. And he warned and he pleaded with them to hear the message so that they would be saved. He was trying to make sure nobody walked away without hearing the gospel message. So then what happened? <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, more what happened at that point. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to them that day. Because there was obedience, they stayed in Jerusalem, they waited for the promise, they spoke out God's word, and 3,000 were added that day. And the birth of the church happened. When we're obedient, and do what God tells us to do and speak out for him, great things can happen. Um, they devoted themselves, and this is the, the rest of these come with the rest of chapter two. So I encourage you, even if the book gives you this, this, this section, read the whole chapter of a, a chapter that they give us. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Great things happen when we're obedient and speak out for Christ. The Lord added to their number daily. And that ought to get us. <laughs> Amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because that means people are being saved and not going to hell. And they're going to have eternal life with Christ. That is a wonderful thing. So the connecting, connecting thought, they were obedient in waiting for the manifestation of the promise of power, which was the Holy Spirit, who would help them fulfill their purpose, because we were given a purpose in the Great Commission of proclaiming the gospel and pointing others to Christ. That, that kind of sums everything up. They were obedient, waiting for the promise, got some power, fulfilling their purpose by proclaiming the gospel and pointing others to Christ. And you might ask, can this happen now? So you had you know, all of that. That was all, that was back then, Minister Graham. Well, can that happen now? Just someone yeah. who's like had this like, huge like revelation change of heart, like, being affected in some way. Yeah. There's something you know or something you've heard about. Yeah. Can I think for like just a second? Because yeah. there's so many.
how this encounter with the Holy Spirit started is um, a group of students didn't want to stop worshiping and then they received the Holy Spirit in honesty and in genuineness and um, they started sharing their testimonies and then it didn't stop. I walked um, into the chapel and saw a bunch of students um, worshiping together very um, intimately. It just, everyone was crying, hands were in the air. It was just showcasing the love of God in so many ways that I had kind of forgotten about. And um, I remember I was with a friend and we were standing in the doorway and I turned to him and I said, I don't know what they have, but whatever it is, I want this. Our world is dark and our students are hurting and they're, they're lonely, they're angry, they're desperate. And so they've been praying for change. And we've had a lot of great moments on our campus, great chapel services, great speakers, great intentionality, great prayer meetings. And I think after the service on this just regular chapel day, God just started working in their hearts and he's been working in their hearts, but they were obedient to it. You know, when you think about how did this start, um, it was nothing anybody did. It was nothing Asbury did. It was nothing that Zach Meercreeps did. It was nothing that any student did. Um, you know, I believe that it was just a, like a pure and a deep cry for more of God's spirit that these students had. And look where it's gotten us. And so we have people from all over the world now. I was one of the people who stayed um, immediately after the chapel service. So we had kind of a soft ending. Um, we said, people are allowed to continue to worship, um, but I just, I just continue to sit in my seat and pray and just reflect on who God was. Um, went to my 12 o'clock class, and then when I got out of class, I heard the singing, and I said, okay, that's, that's weird. Why is this still continuing? Um, so I went back up, and it, it was surreal. The peace that was in the room um, was unexplainable. And a couple of buddies and I just went to run around to the different classrooms and barged in on classes and said, revival's happening. Yes, it can happen in 2023. They were just obedient, regular chapel service. They were led to continue the service and it continued and it continued for two weeks. If we're obedient and we're speaking God's word, wonderful things can happen. We never know what it might be. It might be something as grand as Pentecost Day. It could be a revival like they experienced in Kentucky. It can be one person over here is saved that would not have ever been saved had you they not come in contact with you. Big numbers, small numbers, if we are obedient to God and speaking out his word, wonderful things can happen. Yes, ma'am. One of the things, one of the things that I said in the lesson is instead of a humble, subdued group, uh, of Christians playing, climbing in the room, and uh, that we can transform at that time to 3,000 people praying, praying, and, and witnessing to Jesus. And, and when we look back at, at the early church, it was a truly healthy church, uh, a model for us today. Um, I guess it, it, is, it is my plan and I'm offering I'm sure that we continue to seriously take the biblical qualifications of what it means to be the church. And built into that is that obedience. Um, because he's going to create healthy. He, he can't create something that's not healthy. So if we're seeking and following after the footsteps of Christ and moving in the Holy Spirit, healthiness will come. Amen. We will see the salvation of the Lord. Absolutely. So my uh, challenge to you is to hear him and obey him. 
obey what he says to do in his word. And then when he's speaking to you individually, because there are going to be times that he's talking to you individually. It's not in the scripture because it's not going to say in there, Sister Bowman, do this. But he might something be going on in your life and he's saying, I need you to do this. And he needs you to do it when he asks you to do it, how he's asking you to do it, because he's asking you that for a purpose, because he can see what can happen. We have to have the faith and trust that he knows what that is and the wonderful things he can do. And we're going to get you a little snippet because this is a wonderful song. If you get a chance, I'm going to send you the link. You can listen to the whole Sorry, that's all you can get. <laughs> Just like you did it before, Lord, we are ready for more. Let's be obedient, waiting for and moving in the manifestation of the promise of power through the Holy Spirit, who will give help fulfill us in our purpose for the proclaiming of the gospel and pointing others to Christ. Pastor, it is in your hands. Amen. And we want to. Reverend Graham for teaching us this lesson this morning, uh, the day of Pentecost. Uh, we know that three things stand out. And those three things, uh, first of all, unity. Second of all, the Holy Spirit comes and phenomenal growth of the church. Those are the three things that really stand out in this lesson. Unity, Holy Spirit, and phenomenal growth of the church. If we could just have that, at our local churches, uh, we could experience phenomenal growth, but we first have to have the unity. We have to have the um, uh, Holy Spirit and the spoken word. Those three things have to operate. Uh, nothing that we can do to ever strategize other than to be, as Reverend Graham said, be obedient to God, speak the word, 
and let the Holy Spirit do its work. Too often we try to strategize, we try to bring in people to uh, help us with gro growth is something that God does. Growth is something that God does. We can position ourselves uh, as the early apostles did. Uh, what we can do is be obedient. What we can do is speak the word, but growth is something that God does. The farmer can put the seed in the ground, but it takes to what? Nature to make it grow. This is what we, we can't do God's part. God is asking us to do our part. So we want to thank Reverend Graham for teaching us this lesson this morning, a wonderful lesson. And yes, Pentecost can happen over and over again if we have those three things operating, unity, Holy Spirit, um, spoken word, and then the growth will come. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for this lesson this morning. We want to thank you for our teacher and all of those who have chimed in. Lord, we know that this growth can happen. And we know, Father, that we pray that it will happen again. And Lord, just like Peter told the crowd when they asked, what shall we do? And Lord, we're asking that question in the midst of, of mass shootings, in the midst of political division, in the midst of so much chaos in this world. I can hear through the annals of time, people are asking, what shall we do? And then Father, we can hear the answer through the annals of time, repent, repent, repent. And Lord, if this nation would repent, if the church would repent, Lord, if our government would repent, we would experience a Pentecost like they did in the days of the early church. So Father, we just know that the answer is with us and your Holy Spirit, but we have to do our part and then you'll do your part. Bless us now as we close out our Sunday school and enter into worship. We pray that you pour out that same spirit upon us as you did the day of Pentecost. These are all blessings we ask in our son Jesus' name and the people of God said, amen, amen.